You're listening to the Witness History podcast with me, Louise Hidalgo. Today, we're going back to the 1980s and the war between Iran and Iraq. The war began in September 1980 when Saddam Hussein sent Iraqi troops into Iran, and it would turn out to be one of the longest wars of the 20th century. With the Gulf War now in its third week, Iraqi forces have chalked up their biggest victory so far, taking the key Iranian port of Khurram Shah. As we entered Khurram Shah, the evidence of bitter fighting lay all around. Rubble, burnt out cars, walls pitted with bullet holes and gaping holes made by exploding shells. In the first few weeks, there was no resistance at all. The Iraqi forces gained good ground, and everybody in Iraq thought that the war is finished. And Saddam Hussein was on TV saying, you know, we'll finish the war in six days. But he was mistaken, of course. Ahmed al Mushadad was 18 in 1980, a medical student living in Baghdad. He would be 26 when the Iran-Iraq war did finally end, eight years later. I started the medical school in 1980 and I thought to myself, that war will finish while I'm studying, but I finished my medical school, then I graduated and I did uh, a year of uh, foundation in the hospital and then I went to, to the war. During yeah. those years, was it always a shadow that you knew you would one day have to go and fight? It's affected every minute in, in my life, in the life of Iraqis, you know, because it's on the TV, on the radio, your neighbor's son killed, there's air attacks every week. So it's so horrible, horrible. I lost lots of my friends. I lost lots of my cousins. You can't do anything. I was a writer. You can't write anything not supporting the war and supporting the regime. So you're watched all the times, despite the fact that there is a big war, the intelligence, the security personnel watching everybody in Iraq. Finally, almost seven years into the war, the letter arrived that Ahmed had been dreading, calling him up to serve as a doctor in the army. It's a letter you expect, but you don't want to arrive. Going to the war at that time, you you know, there's 90% you won't come back. And you can't escape that fate because you can't just refuse. Uh, you can't run away because if you run away, they get you. If they don't get you, they get your family. So when you, you don't say, have any choice. When you say get you, what would they have done? Well, they kill you. You know, they try you. You don't get any defense, any chance to defend yourself. And you go behind the sun. By 1987, the war was at a virtual stalemate. Tens of thousands had already died and continued to die as both sides threw wave upon wave of young conscripts across the front line. And it was a war that in many ways echoed the First World War, a war of mustard gas and trenches and barbed wire. We're standing on what they say to us is the international border between Iran and Iraq. In front of me is just a front trench line with sandbags dugouts. No very heavy arms around here. In front, though, there's some barbed wire and big pools, possibly made by shells and then filled with water. In fact, the defences don't seem at all effective. It's quite strange to think that this war, which has cost so many people's lives, has been fought in territory like this. The battle for Basra, the oil capital of Iraq in July this year, left 10,000 Iraqi dead and up to 50,000 Iranian corpses rotting in the 125 degree desert. The Iranians, especially the young volunteers, died in human wave attacks on heavily defended Iraqi positions. Clutching their dog tags, Khomeini's passports to paradise, they charged across minefields straight into machine gun fire. I was deployed to a brigade in the south in a city called uh, Amara, Misan, which is near Basra. That year, the, the war was at its peak. And I remember approaching my unit, I can hear the bombing louder and louder and louder. And my heart rate goes faster and faster and faster. Everything was under the ground, all the soldiers. And every day from that, they were in, in a compact. So we tried to maintain our humanity, you know, 
Um, in the unit with me, there were eight male nurses. They were from different parts of Iraq, from North Kurds, Sunni Shia, and they looked after me because I didn't have any military experience. And they were like in the war for five or six years. So they were giving me tips to avoid bombing minefields. You know, when there is a suspicion of chemical attack, they give me some tricks and some tips. And um, I love them all. And um, I, I see them in my dreams till now. I see those days in my dreams, you know, every week. By 1988, both Iraq and Iran were exhausted. But the fight moved up to their northern borders. And it was here in the dying days of the war that Ahmed's battalion was sent and would fight its most devastating battle, even though Iran by then had actually accepted a UN-mediated truce. We lost about 1,500 soldiers in three days. We were providing first aid. We give people IV fluids and painkillers and we're just full with the blood and screaming. Horrible. Horrible. I still smell the smoke still now. You know, when I walk in the streets, sometimes I, I smell the smoke from mm. those days, you know. That was a battle for a small mountain quite near Halabja, wasn't it? Near the Iranian yeah. border in the north. Yeah, it was, was in a, a town called Rania. So our brigade was deployed to take over a mountain in, in Rania. Nobody heard of it. And all the soldiers, we all thought that the war is finished. Come on. You know, Khomeini said, I took the decision and that's it. But we walked to the mountain with the soldiers and we we can see, you know, the shelling, the suffering of the soldiers. We, as I said, we lost 1,500 people. And then after three days, we withdrew because we couldn't get control of the place. After the battle, Ahmed was accused by his brigade commander of helping soldiers to escape by sending people with only minor wounds to the field hospital behind the front line. And he gave me a list of hundreds of people. He said, you're the cause of failure of this operation. And I, I understand that, you know, after that, that he wanted to cover up for something missing from his side. For one heart-stopping moment, Ahmed thought he'd be court-martialed and shot. But he was saved as other officers intervened and told the commander how hard Ahmed had worked saving lives. But was the commander right? Had he helped those young soldiers not return to the front line? I let everybody go. <laughs> they look into your eyes saying, please keep us here, don't send that back. I, I still know the names of these soldiers, you know, and I still remember their faces, how grateful they were because they survived. I mean, Iraq lost about a million. This is a forgotten war. During that war, nobody remembered us. It was a forgotten war. But 30 years on, those who fought in the war and who witnessed it and who survived it, like Ahmed, have not forgotten. The thing that stay in my mind, the, the faces of the soldiers, when they go to the battle and they say goodbye, and you know and they know they might not come back. It's just like a, a sting in the heart. I remember all these faces. The Iran-Iraq war ended on the 20th of August, 1988. Two years later, Iraq embarked on another war, invading Kuwait. Ahmed al mushtaq did not fight in that war. In 1994, he left Iraq. He continued to work as a doctor. He's also a published poet.